I remember going on a trip to Florida a few years ago, and about halfway there, I was overtaken by a really overwhelming sense of depression. And I remember thinking that these states we were passing through, states I had never visited before, all looked essentially identical to the Indiana I'd just left behind. It felt as if America was this giant recursive fractal of stoplights and subways and dingy Walmarts, and no matter how far you traveled, you could never quite escape the infinite strip mall. Early in the crying of Lot 49, there's an image that really stuck with me in the three years since I first read the novel. An image of a highway like a hypodermic needle injected into the endless sprawl of prefab and beige factories. As if we the people were only here to keep alive the system that had long since ceased to serve us. As if our only purpose was to be the blood and the veins of unfeeling corporations. I think part of what makes America's homogenous cities so eerie is that we also recognize the world has never been so diverse and advanced and full of strange wonders. We can turn on our phones or televisions and watch the endless feed of new discoveries and seismic change, yet when we look out our windows it's just old houses and weather-beaten Toyotas. So, to fill the gap between the world as we experience it day to day, and the world as we see it on the infinite feed, we must invent and identify with stories that enforce order on the rippling ocean of chaos and confusion. When the only constant is capital, it seems like every meaning is equal to every other. Sometimes, it's like all the office buildings, and dying malls, and franchise restaurants, or a front concealing some huge conspiracy we can never quite understand. I own a lot of editions of Crying of Lot 49, but this one has to be my favorite. They make it look like such a trashy dime novel. Who is Oedipa Mass, and what is the strange legacy of her ex-lover Pierce and Verarity, California real estate mogul, that first led her to the bizarre postal network called Waste, then to Genghis Cohen, who likes his sex with the news on, and then to the worldwide conspiracy known as the Tristero system, and then on into the mystery and an enigma of America itself. That's not really what the book's about. What is the book about? That detective is the right question. Well, to offer a highly reductive summary, The Crying of Lot 49 is about differentiating between reality and fantasy in a capitalist world. On page 10 of the book, Pynchon offers us a useful image to deciphering the novel. Our heroine, Oedipa Mass, recalls an art museum she once visited in Mexico, and in particular, a painting of a number of frail girls with heart-shaped faces, huge eyes, spun gold hair, prisoners in the top room of a circular tower, embroidering a kind of tapestry which spilled out of the slit windows and into a void, seeking hopelessly to fill the void. For all the other buildings and creatures, all the waves, ships, and forests of the earth were contained in this tapestry and the tapestry was the world. At its dark core, the novel questions whether differentiating between the tapestry and what is real is possible in the industrial hellscape of mass delusion, alternative facts, and corporate conspiracy that is 2021. 1965, under the presidency of one Lyndon B. Johnson, the year in which the first American troops arrived to a small country called Vietnam, a world 56 years removed from the present. Early in the novel, Pynchon describes the setting of a play that the characters have gone to see, The Courier's Tragedy. And his description seems to me a window into how he viewed the world of 1965. Pre-apocalyptic, death-wishful, sensually fatigued, unprepared a little poignantly for that abyss of civil war. Given that the book is about the impossibility of understanding the world, the novel can be occasionally hard to read. If you've been assigned this book in English class, I wouldn't be ashamed for making judicious use of spark notes to piece together the vagaries of the plot. However, it's important to remember that the hundreds of story threads that don't all tie together aren't meant to necessarily cohere in the end. 
Pynchon uses his art to reflect life, and as such, not everything is going to resolve into happy endings. The Crying of Lot 49 is the only Pynchon novel set approximately in the same time period in which he was writing it. So, in my opinion, the book functions as a skeleton key to his work, less of a novel than a manifesto or declaration of intent, demonstration of method. Pynchon himself didn't really consider the book to be a novel either. In the introduction to his short story learner, uh, collection Slow Learner, he refers to the novel as a short story with gland problems. As such, the book is essentially one long, dense short story about Oedipa Mass, a Southern California housewife who is named Executrix of the will of her former lover Pierce Emberarity, a wealthy real estate mogul. On her journey to untangle and distribute his many assets, Oedipa uncovers a potential conspiracy involving a secret postal system known as the Tristero, and attempts over the course of a few feverish days in LA to unravel the twisted web of history, legend, and lies surrounding this secret society. As with most pension novels, it is a book both literally and metaphorically about a quest for truth and what we learn about ourselves along the way. While it's easy to get caught up in the intellectual intricacies of Pynchon's labyrinthine stories, I don't think enough Pynchon scholars talk about the sheer pleasure of reading his work. My most recent time around, I read The Crown of Lot 49 in two sittings, one in the evening, one in the next morning, and it played out in my mind like a surreal and enchanting movie. The novel is funny and warm and inviting, and even if you're not interested in plumbing the depths of philosophy here, you'll enjoy the reading experience. I think a lot of postmodern writers, even as they ostensibly write against power and privilege, nevertheless fall prey to a kind of academic elitism, a snobbish sense of superiority over the proletariat who might just not have time to read their latest 900-page joyless brick. Pynchon never looks down on the common man, and he doesn't look down on pop culture either. Pynchon understands that pop culture, and this novel particularly pop music, is a coping mechanism, with its sunny optimism providing an escape for those beaten down by the system. The book, in my opinion, has an unearned reputation for cerebral difficulty. At its core, it's just a wacky detective story, a proto-Big Lebowski, full of satire, puns, and adventure. But beneath all these silly songs and strange names, the novel charts an entropic path towards the dissolution of reality. As Oedipa digs deeper into the contradictory histories of the Tristero, Pynchon teaches us about how we construct stories in order to maintain our sanity. Why is Oedipa so driven to uncover the secrets of the secret postal service, only tangentially related to her reasons for visiting San Narciso? From the second she hears about the mystery, she's captivated and obsessed. Maybe it's just the sad fact that the idea of this unsolvable conspiracy is simply more interesting than real life more interesting than her dull marriage with Mucho, her unidentified psychological problems that cause her psychiatrist to phone in the middle of the night offering her LSD. Oedipa craves purpose, some way to reverse the entropy of existence. And I mean that quite literally. About halfway through the book, Oedipa meets the crazed scientist John Nefastus, who has constructed a machine which purportedly contains Maxwell's demon. Nefastus claims this is a perpetual motion machine, that if you are a sensitive, you can focus on the box and force the molecules inside to move from hot to cold without expending effort, and thus generate unlimited energy. Oedipa tries her absolute best. Pynchon writes, For fifteen minutes more she tried, repeating, If you are there, whatever you are, show yourself to me. I need you. Show yourself. But nothing happened. So... Yes, there's a scene in the book where the main character literally attempts to reverse entropy. Few postmodern authors work in such plain view, but The Crying of Lot 49 is so richly layered that Pynchon can afford to put a lot of the meaning of the novel on the surface. The real question is what do we do after we've realized we can't unravel the mystery? What do we cling to in a world of T.S. Eliot's broken images? Well. Oedipa clings to the idea of a conspiracy, 
a conspiracy that she's not even sure is a conspiracy. It might all be a practical joke by her ex-lover. But she doesn't give up. And by the end of the novel, she is still searching, still hovering on the edge of a revelation that we realize by now will probably never arrive. We understand that she has to believe in this conspiracy, even as she tries at times to give it up. Without it, she has nothing in this world. During one of the novel's climactic scenes, Oedipa visits her psychiatrist, Dr. Hilarious, who in true Pinchonian fashion is revealed to be an ex-Nazi on the run, of course. There's a brief and telling exchange of dialogue between them. I came, she said, hoping you could talk me out of a fantasy. Cherish it, cried Hilarious fiercely. What else do any of you have? Hold it tightly by its little tentacle. Don't let the Freudians coax it away or the pharmacists poison it out of you. Whatever it is, hold it dear. For when you lose it, you go over by that much to the others. You begin to cease to be. Of course, those words are spoken by a character, not by Pynchon himself. And that character isn't a particularly admirable type either. But the sentiment remains poignant nonetheless. What else do any of us have? That's just one of the questions asked by this hyper-dense novel, which manages to encompass more themes in 152 pages than many novels do in 500. The role of media in this novel adds an entirely different layer of depth. The story is packed to the brim with television actors, plays within plays, images and fictions encroaching on reality and overtaking it. One of my favorite scenes involves the character of Metzger, a lawyer who, as a kid, acted in a movie called Cashiered, which just happens to be playing on television as he reveals this to Oedipa. As they watch this bizarre film about a naval adventure, Metzger seems to recall the events on screen as if they were real history, not fiction. I know this part, Metzger told her, his eyes squeezed shut, head away from the set. For 50 yards out, the sea was red with blood. They don't show that. In this world of broken images, it is easy to be confused. Smarter readers than me have broken down the elaborate intricacies of The Courier's Tragedy, a play which Oedipus sees in Chapter 3, a play which Pynchon devotes a significant chunk of the novel to describing. I'm content with saying that the play is ridiculously entertaining to read, a wildly over-the-top Jacobian revenge drama involving copious bloodshed and orgies and ending with a mysterious few lines of poetry that compel Oedipa on her quest. While well, I'm sure one can find a scholarly article explaining every single interaction and vignette along the journey, I think Pynchon wants some moments and characters to remain ambiguous. After all, he is attempting to evoke a world in which not everything can be intellectualized and rationalized into sense. The crying of Lot 49 is in some ways a testing ground for the methods he would later develop into his later maximalist operatic Gravity's Rainbow. The Crying of Lot 49 is a critical text for understanding Pynchon, and also postmodernism as a whole. I think Pynchon's role in the postmodern genre is fascinating. I'm no literature historian, but it seems to me like Nabokov was sort of the handoff from modernism to postmodernism. He has multiple novels that people classify in each category. And Pynchon was, in true Greek philosopher fashion, Nabokov's student. Old Vladimir did not recall him in class, but his wife remembered Tom's extremely neat handwriting. And The Crying of Lot 49 contains a tribute to two, or two, to his old professor, while ultimately hacking forward into unknown territory. This novel not only contains skeleton keys for understanding Pynchon's own oeuvre, but for understanding the dozens of authors and artists that would later be inspired by him, the Volmans and Wallaces, if we're talking Pomo Lit, and the Andersons and Kaufmans and Coens, if we're talking film. The novel continues to have a far-reaching influence on art today, and certain sections seem almost cliched if you don't realize that this was where the cliches had their genesis. Indeed, were the book published today, I think it would fit quite nicely into the current modern landscape of fiction. The novel doesn't seem dated at all. Maybe that's why so many storytellers are still shamelessly ripping it off, such as David Robert Mitchell's entertaining, albeit derivative, Under the Silver Lake from 2018. 
decent movie, the first hour of which is essentially the closest we'll get to a full-on Crying of Lot 49 film adaptation. Pension's mazes and mysteries are endlessly compelling, and the novel remains a pleasure to read. As I mentioned earlier, its difficulty is overstated, I think. The book is an excellent entry point into Pynchon's work. Most of the novel transpires at almost screenplay briskness, although Pynchon allows himself one or two long, dreamy paragraphs of poetic prose per chapter, reminding us of his consummate skill as a prose stylist. Later works of his would be composed almost entirely of this dreamy, over-the-top style. In Lot 49, it's limited to a few grand crescendos. Chapter 5 of the novel, concerning Oedipa's feverish walk through the San Narciso nightscape, seeing the post-horn symbol everywhere she goes, still stands as some of Pynchon's best writing ever, a dark and heartbreaking elegy for the preterite and the lost, an eerie nightmare of secrets and codes everywhere you look. In my opinion, The Crying of Lot 49 is a masterpiece a beautiful book which I will continue to appreciate further on each new reading. Its existence is itself consolation for living in this world that has only grown somehow more fragmented and more monotonous since the book was published. It is pension reaching across time to let you know that someone else understands how it feels to live in the modern world. He might not be able to offer the answer, but we are invited to join in the investigation. Under the freeway, he waved her on in the direction she'd been going. Always one, you'll see it. The eyes closed, cammed each night out of that safe furrow, the bulk of this city's waking each sunrise again set virtuously to plowing. What rich soils had he turned? What concentric planets uncovered? What voices overheard? Flenders of luminescent gods glimpsed among the wallpaper's stained foliage. Candle stubs lit to rotate in the air over him, prefiguring the cigarette he or a friend must fall asleep someday smoking, thus to end among the flaming secret salts held all those years by the insatiable stuffing of a mattress that could keep vestiges of every nightmare sweat, helpless overflowing bladder, viciously tearfully consummated wet dream, like the memory bank to a computer of the lost. She was overcome all at once by a need to touch him, as if she could not believe in him, or would not remember him without it. Exhausted, hardly knowing what she was doing, she came the last three steps and sat, took the man in her arms, actually held him, gazing out of her smudged eyes down the stairs, back into the morning. She felt wetness against her breast and saw that he was crying again. He hardly breathed, but tears came as if being pumped. I can't help, she whispered, rocking him. I can't help.